We're excited to announce that our very own podcasting platform, Zencaster, has become a new sponsor to the show. Check out the podcast discount link in our show notes and stay tuned for why we love using Zen for the podcast. You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. This is the CRM Archaeology Podcast. It's the show where we pull back the veil of cultural resources management, archaeology, and discuss the issues that everyone is concerned about. Welcome to the podcast. Hello and welcome to the CRM Archaeology Podcast, episode 222 for September 8th, 2021. I'm your host, Chris Webster. On today's show, we talk to archaeologist Maggie Berry about her unique journey to becoming a CRM archaeologist. The CRM Archaeology Podcast starts right now. All right, welcome to the show, everyone. Joining me today is Bill in California. Good afternoon. And Heather in California. Hi, everyone. All right. So, hey, I wanted to start by saying, as everybody knows, you know, my wife and I are traveling around in an RV and always in different places. So right now we're sitting along a river in Laconor, Washington. So there might be some sounds, people walking by, boat horns. It's a you beautiful know, area. I know. And it's good ambiance. So there you go. So let's talk. I got an email a few weeks ago, probably about a month ago at this point, from Maggie Berry and She's like, hey, I listen to your guys' podcast and I feel like I have a, a unique story for getting into CRM. And to be honest, my first thought was, okay, yeah, everybody emails us and says they have a unique story for getting into CRM because we all have <laughs> unique stories. And that's actually true. Like everybody gets yes. into this in a different way. That wasn't like a disparaging remark. But then she wrote a little bit about herself and was like, yeah, this is unique for sure. It's definitely something, you know, an approach I hadn't heard before. So Let's just welcome her first. Maggie, welcome to the show. Hi, nice to be here. Yeah. So, well, where are you calling in from right now? Let's start there. I am in South Central Colorado. Okay. So if you've ever been by the Great Sand Dunes, kind of by there. <laughs> okay. Okay. Nice. Nice. Yeah, that's a that's a beautiful area. My wife and I are actually going to go through there probably in about a month or so on our way to Texas, I think. So, yeah. Nice. That'll be cool. All right. So let's talk about... Your journey to becoming an archaeologist, you went to the University of California, Davis, and you got a BA in American Studies with a focus on culture and consumption, which is not something I've never necessarily heard of leading to a, a career in CRM. You know, you hear about anthropology degrees, of course, cultural anthropology type focus degrees, history degrees, things like that. But American Studies with a focus on culture and consumption, it doesn't sound like you intended to go into a career in CRM. What was your original intent with those choices? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's uh, definitely 100% correct. I think <laughs> when I went to Davis, a major reason I chose there is I'm originally from Southern California. So Encinitas, mm -hmm. if anybody's been around that area. I know, Heather, you work in the South a little bit or Southern California. Our, uh, yeah, my company is actually based in Encinitas. Oh so, my gosh, wow. Yeah, I'm very familiar with Encinitas. I oh. like Encinitas a lot, yeah. actually. I'm an Encinitas oh, fan as well. I love that place. Oh. Yeah. It's pretty sweet. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's such a small world. That's great, yeah. actually. <laughs> I'll remember that for later on. <laughs> yes, um, please. <laughs> but so I ended up getting accepted to Davis, and part of that reason was I was a student athlete there. I was a Division One field hockey player. So I got a scholarship and that's one of the major reasons I chose Davis as well as staying in state. And during that time, I think a lot of people can relate when they're trying to find their major. You might choose something <laughs> when you're applying to a school and completely change that within the first year or a couple times that first year. And honestly, American studies was a major that I sort of fell into. I ended up taking an elective and I ended up really enjoying it. And I always liked history, but the aspect that you're kind of analyzing how things are the way they are and then comparing that to other cultures. And mm. I think I've kind of followed that through my trajectory, but I kind of fell into American studies because I liked the initial information and I was doing pretty well in it. <laughs> I think I originally wanted to go into nursing and that's a little bit my mom thought I would be pretty good at that. And it was very difficult. So I ended up not working out alongside of being a student athlete. But yeah, so American Studies, I chose, uh, you can kind of make your own major and culture and consumption seemed like I could do a little bit of like analysis in a business world. Mm. So ideally, I thought I would do a bit of marketing and kind of get into a job with that. You left university and you went 
into the Peace Corps? What, what led you to go into the Peace Corps instead of, or, or, or did, in your mind, were you kind of satisfying what your studies were all about? You know what I mean? What was this, was this in relation to that or was this just completely out of left field? I'm going to do this now. Uh, I think now looking back, you know, 2020, I can kind of see why I chose that direction. And I was actually yeah. influenced in high school. I had a teacher, an English teacher who was in the Peace Corps. I forget exactly where he went, but I just remember him talking about his adventures abroad and kind of the help that he provided for his village when he was working there. And I knew in high school, I was going to do that. I, I wanted to do it. It was something I inspired to mm-hmm. do. And during that time, It was back in, let's see, I graduated in 2013, so quite a few years ago now. And during that time, the process took a bit longer. So it was a year-long application. So I started the process when I was a junior, knowing that by the time I finished my senior year of university, I would be able to hopefully go where I would get selected. And yeah, I mean, basically, I was inspired by my teacher, and I also felt a huge amount of gratitude for just the life I'd been given living in Encinitas. Mm -hmm. I think we can agree. A lot of you have been there. It's beautiful area. I also got to play hockey when I was in college and I had a lot of great opportunities and I really wanted to give back as, you know, I think that's a very cheesy saying, but at the same time, I wanted to see the world. I wanted to help other people. And in those experiences, you always gain more than you can ever give to anybody else, but it was such a great way And I would encourage this for so many other people. If you ever want to get abroad, you think it's kind of impossible. The Peace Corps is a really great option as a way to see the world and just to completely change your worldview and how you live your life. So you you did your Peace Corps stint in Botswana. Did you get to choose that or did they basically just tell you where you're going based on need? It's been pretty interesting because since this time, I think there is a bit more ability to choose. During this time, I originally met with a recruiter in my senior year, and she was asking me questions of where I wanted to go, what I wanted to do. A lot of countries do have language requirements. Botswana does as well, but there is a huge amount of English spoken there, so it's not pivotal to your mission or your job. So when I was doing that, she was asking me specifically about my experience working in anything with nursing or HIV and AIDS, because Botswana has a huge issue with HIV and AIDS right now. And actually Uh, all in like Southern Africa as well. There's a great book called like the invisible cure. That's probably out to date, but it's a great insight as to why that issue happened within Southern Africa compared to, you know, the United United States that was more like the eighties or something. So she was asking me if I had any experience with that. And I said, no. So I ended up volunteering at our like health clinic and got a little experience with that. But pretty much it was you had completed your application. And during this time, they were sending huge intake groups. So I think my intake group was about 60 people or so. Now I think they're doing a bit smaller intake groups and they might be doing them every other year. And that also depends like each country as well, too. And that's what you'll hear a lot as well. One person's experience <laughs> in Peace Corps can be completely different than somebody else's. And Oh, I bet. Yeah. So it's always yeah. it's always interesting. And actually, when you're in D.C. right now, there's a huge amount of ex um, Peace Corps volunteers there because most of them are working in the federal government. I have a handful of friends working specifically in D.C. right now. But if you're in Washington, you might see some. I think that, you know, the one element of the Peace Corps, which I think is consistent with also being an athlete, um, is just being able to, you know, be given an assignment and not always be in charge of what of what you want to do. So, mm-hmm. um, and I think in CRM that definitely definitely a, a benefit. I find that people that have the, those experiences, whether it be a teammate, and by the way, my first career was in ice hockey. Actually, oh. so you know, we have something very in common yeah, here. Yeah, definitely. On grass, I'm on ice, but <laughs> so. You know, having that team mentality, Chris, came from the military, Mm -hmm. Peace Corps, where you're given an assignment and it's a lot of times it's a challenge because you haven't, you you don't, I mean, I can imagine Botswana (laughs) and you're you're not always sure if you can actually, you know, do what it is that they're asking you to do. And I think being able to have that flexibility, you know, personality wise, having that experience, I'm sure must have, I would think have helped you in the field so far in archaeology? Have you found that? And if so, you know, maybe share an experience, if you could share an experience that represents that. 
Yeah, definitely. I love how you're kind of connecting the dots here because even for me, I, I know that some skills are transferable, but that's so true when you're in Peace Corps. Overall, you do have a mission. So I was based at a junior secondary school, which is about a middle school to high school age range. And specifically, our overarching mission was to do prevention and health education about HIV and AIDS. And for me coming in just right after university, and I didn't have that much experience, it's very humbling to have that idea of wanting to help, but also not really knowing how. And part of that is you don't have the answer. You need to work with other people or your community members in order to create what the issue is and create the solution. And I think you see that all the time in CRM as well. It's a job that you need to kind of be on your feet for. And you're also making the most out of what you have to work with. You're going to make a situation work, whether you're in the field or you're dealing with trucks or you're dealing with equipment or you're dealing with difficult people. And I think it's it's hard to give a, a, a direct answer or direct example, but I think because it is behavioral is what you're trying to do is you're trying to engage with youth and help them know one about like the education of H B and age, but also what their own actions can affect like their own life in general, if that makes sense. I mean, it's just mm-hmm. a way that you grow up and the way that you think. And when I was there, a quarter of the population was infected with HIV and their population about 2 million when I was there. So that's about the size of Texas. It's really small and it's very transient as well, which you do see a lot in our job. A lot of people going to different places because they're government workers, so teachers or policemen or something in that kind of nature, and they're moving all over and they're living their lives. And it's a really easy way to pretty much transmit HIV and AIDS. They call it like a a highway because of the relationships or going to a new place and wanting to make that your home or creating relationships or friendships. And you see that a lot in our work as well, too, where you're moving quite a bit and you really do need to, I don't know, take in the environment and see what you can, you can do from there, if that makes sense. I, I, don't, I think I'm kind of getting a little off topic now, but. No, 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 no. I think it was, per- it was a perfect, it was a perfect, in so many ways, it was a perfect answer because just like you said, I mean, archaeology is not clean. I mean, there's not like mm. this, you don't know exactly, you I mean, even from day to day. You don't know what is going to happen. And I, I laugh all the time with my colleagues that, you know, and, I, and we've even said on the podcast that you start your day off with this idea of a to do list. I'm going to do this, this and this. And then everything starts just flying in and you have to you have to be flexible. You have to triage. You have to yes, figure triage. out what really is the most important thing here. And being able to do that and do it with a critical mind and do it effectively is, is definitely a talent. And it's not something that somebody is innately, you know, you're not born with that. And so it's a, it's a muscle that you have to exercise. And so I think that, you know, you, you did, you gave a, a perfect answer to me because it really is something, just like I said, a muscle that needs to be exercised. And I think uh, a place like the Peace Corps, being a teammate on a division one, you know, field hockey team, those are, are things that really develop your, your, who you are, your world, your worldview, your ability to interact with other people, you know, is, you know, they're key. They're key to a success in any career, but specifically in CRM. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. And along those lines, as we close out segment one here, if you could pick any one thing, which is probably almost impossible to do, but any one thing that you would say you got from the Peace Corps or how the Peace Corps changed you for the better, like, like if you hadn't gone, you wouldn't be this person today. What would that be? It's like a mm. future job interview question. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, are we going to talk about my weaknesses too? <laughs> I know, right? What do you see yourself in five years? No, oh gosh, <laughs> no, that's that's a great question. And I look back on my experience in Peace Corps. It is twenty seven months, so it's over two years. It's a long part of your life, but in the grand scheme of things and behavioral change and really any part of someone's life, that's not that much time. I'm lucky enough Mm -hmm. that I still have quite a bit of relationships that I can still talk to people. Thank goodness we have WhatsApp. I can WhatsApp (laughs) uh, my old counterpart and even some friends I used to work with. But Mm -hmm. I think the biggest thing, that was my first real time being away from the United States. And I think the difference of lifestyle 
not to say that one is better than the other. It's just completely different. And I think in the career that we're in, it's so important to try to understand other people's perspective. Of course, in any aspect of the job, you want to understand who that client is or who your coworker is or who your boss is. And it's going to help give you a better understanding of who they are and what they want. And I would say just coming from that different perspective, that different life and understanding and specifically about like HIV being such a predominant, just a very like a, a part of the community and that people right. are still living their lives. People are doing just such basic things. It's, it was just great for my mind to get away from the ideologies that I had about America and just mm-hmm. how the world can be very different. And I think that's important too, when you're discovering a site, you're trying to get into the minds of, you know, who these people were, what they were doing, how much they were carrying, what kind of lifestyle they're trying to live. So I think at least for the career that we're in, that really helped give me a new perspective that I had never gotten before. And that's so well said, because uh, all of us on here have traveled. And, you know, I was in the Navy, as Heather said, uh, I guess the longest I spent away from the U.S. was probably, I think, six and a half months. But that was on a carrier, right? Like we saw a lot of different countries, but I was also around a lot of Americans and, you know, on, on a carrier like most of the time until we went to port. So I don't really count that as like time away from the U.S. necessarily. But that being said, even just traveling within our country even. And, and if you can get out and spend some time out, that's even better. You just gain that perspective that, Hey, there are other people that think differently for me and that's actually okay. And I feel like if more people did that and left their hometown once in a while, that even this country would be a, a vastly different place and more inclusive and more accepting. So that's Amen. awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if we could ship everybody out to, to do something like that, like mandatorily, I feel like we'd be a different place. But yeah. anyway, yeah. So let's end the segment here. And when we come back, we're going to talk about something completely different, which is a really long hike that you did leading into a few others. <laughs> so let's, let's take a break and talk about that on the other side. Back in a minute. Chris Webster here for the Archaeology Podcast Network. We strive for high quality interviews and content so you can find information on any topic in archaeology from around the world. One way we do that is by recording interviews with our hosts and guests located in many parts of the world all at once. We do that through the use of Zencaster. That's Z E N C A S T R. Zencaster allows us to record high quality audio with no stress on the guest. Just send them a link to click on, and that's it. Zencaster does the rest. They even do automatic transcriptions. Check out the link in the show notes for 30% off your first three months or go to zencastr.com and use the code CRMARC. Looking to expand your knowledge of x-rays and imaging in the archaeology field? Then check out An Introduction to Paleo Radiography, a short online course offering professional training for archaeologists and affiliated disciplines. Created by archaeologist, radiographer, and lecturer James Elliott, the content of this course is based upon his research and teaching experience in higher education. It is approved by the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists as four hours of training. That's in the UK, for those of you that don't know. So don't miss out on this exciting opportunity for professional and personal development. For more information on pricing and course structure, visit paleoimaging.com. That's P-A-L-E-O imaging.com. And look for the link in the show notes to this episode. Welcome back to the CRM Archaeology Podcast, episode 222. And we are talking to Maggie Berry about her life and career and journey to archaeology. So in the last segment, you finished your degree. You went into the Peace Corps for 27 months. I know know what you did next, and we're going to talk about that. But I'm curious, like, when you see this time coming to an end, this ridiculously odd but awesome time, like, it's it's an experience you've never had before. How do you reconcile that? You know what I mean? You're you're seeing those months tick down. What do you do next? I feel like I would have a similar reaction to you that that you did. It's just like, I'm going to do something completely different because I don't even know what to do. This was so almost mind-blowing, you know what I mean, and and life-changing. Absolutely. And it's really hard to kind of condense that into a paragraph or a sentence right when you get home (laughs) and people ask you. And they actually do trainings on this for uh, your end of service. It's about three Mm, months before you leave. And they kind of talk about transitioning back into the States because there is quite a bit of a culture shock. And I know for me, I was really excited to be finished. I was ready to head home. But at the same time, you're kind of left with this feeling of what did I even do (laughs) a little bit, you have projects and you have certain 
things that you did and you went to school every day and you taught lessons, but at the, at the end of it, it feels a little like you want something like a physical manifestation of the time that you Mm -hmm. spent there or the time that changed. And I know for me, when I got back, I felt in a weird limbo. I went to Peace Corps right after I finished university. So that was kind Mm -hmm. of my plan. I was gone for about two years and well, I guess actually, let me go back a little bit because uh, right when I finished, I had my best friend in Peace Corps and she had this crazy scheme to go all the way up the east side of Southern Africa to pretty much the Middle East, pretty much to like Palestine or Israel, depending on where. And wow. so I ended up going with her because you get this readjustment allowance from Peace Corps once you finish. So <laughs> I moved back with my parents right afterwards. So I just blew that money or at least half of it. <laughs> and we just traveled some more just because we were there and the time seemed right. But when I did get back, Peace Corps does prepare you for it. They tell you that it's going to be really hard to conceptualize two years of your life living in a different country. And mm. now people say, oh, you're, you're back to your normal life. And as if that time that you spent there you know, it was just a weird little adventure you had or a parallel <laughs> universe, if you will. Totally. Yeah. And I, I felt really lost. A lot of my friends were two years out of school. They had started their careers. They had started paths on their careers or they were living in other places. And I had moved back with my family and I had had this great experience. And I was learning to deal with the amount of privilege and guilt that I had living as an American and coming back to all the opportunities that I had, I I knew a lot of the kids that I was working with, they would never leave Botswana. They would never leave their small town and they would either hopefully get a job with the government or maybe they would be on welfare from, or from Botswana itself. So it, it was really a strange time, happy, a little sad. And I guess that transition kind of led me to trying to figure out what my next step would be. And during the time between that, I went to go visit my brother in uh, Northern California. So also Berkeley mm-hmm. area, actually, Bill. So around you. <laughs> and his partner was telling me about the Pacific Crest Trail that she had hiked in 2008, I believe. And that idea just caught fire very quickly because uh, it was like <laughs> a physical challenge coming after kind of being more stagnant when I was in Botswana and not exercising as much and kind of wanting to get back into physical shape, but also emotional processing. And you do so a lot on long hikes or long distance trails. You see veterans or people that have served before and they're dealing with PTSD. They're called like the wounded warriors. Mm -hmm. And it's a way to kind of process what you've been thinking about your experiences and for me, it was kind of an escape to being, oh, like you're back from Southern Africa or you're back from Africa or you're back from Botswana instead of, oh, like now you're back from the woods. And it, it yeah. really helped me like transition and feel more normalized <laughs> and kind of come to terms with a lot of things. So I had about six months to do that. So, you know, it took my time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like most people can relate to, oh, I went on a, you know, I went on a hike for six months, as difficult as that is that most people can understand it seems like an easier answer almost Uh, and not that you were searching for an easier answer, but an easier answer to, I was in Botswana for two years. Let me summarize that for you in two sentences. Easier to relate to, I think. Yeah. That's what I was looking for. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I see a lot of correlation between that and perhaps your experience as a, uh, in the military. Do I, Mm -hmm. I traveled all over the world, but the most amount of time I've spent outside of America is about a month. And yeah. that in and of itself is difficult, but I actually, it's, it's probably prepares you for those conversations that you have, that everybody, mm-hmm. you know, always asking about archeology, span everybody's very curious about our, you know, about our career and what it is that we do. And, and yeah. I would also think on a smaller scale, being around, just like you said, Maggie, you alluded to earlier that, you know, traveling and doing uh, some, you know, longer surveys, a few months or, or whatnot, and then being able to acclimate again, as much as that was difficult for you, you exercised that muscle a few times before you got into CRM. So have you seen that be a benefit so far? Definitely. And I think it, I can see it more now during that time. I just, I really was lost is, is a good way yeah. to put it. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of people can 
kind of relate to that or understand, like, I don't know exactly what the next step will be, or I can't envision the next step, or even in the jobs that we work when it is seasonal, what's going to be next? Or am I going to make that jump from a crew chief to a PI or to a field director, or am I going to try to get a permanent position? And you really need to be quite flexible in, in CRM in general. And I don't know, I think it's, it's okay not quite to know. And you never, I think it kind of has to do with like a little networking as well, too. Mm-hmm. You don't know where that conversation is going to go or that exposure to maybe somebody's research project or what's going to inspire you overall. And for example, for what I did with the PCT, I had met my brother's partner and she was telling me of her experience and I had the time off. I wasn't working. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And I still had a bit of money left over from my allowance from Peace Corps. So it kind of fit together really well. And just living in Southern California, Mm -hmm. that's pretty much the start. My parents drove me to the border. So that only took about an hour and a half. So I already had a lot of things going for me and I was able to use her gear as well too. And I think that's kind of in life in general, whether it doesn't matter exactly what you're doing. If you have enough resources, you just have to go for things sometimes and it could completely fail and you could do terrible, but (laughs) that's the worst that could happen. And at least it is a learning experience and that stuff does humble you, but it also makes Mm -hmm. you stronger too. And I don't know, I try to follow that with things that I'm doing. If, if it's yeah. scary, it's usually I should do it. <laughs> I'm like, oh, God, I don't want to do it. I'm nervous. Even, even this interview, I was like, I don't know. Uh, like, uh, I think yeah. um, for me, CRM or archaeology is kind of a second career, even though I didn't have that first career. It was me just bumbling about <laughs> trying to make yeah. it work. And I don't know, at some point, it, it, it's just why, why not? Why not try it and see mm-hmm. and see how it goes? So I guess that's just in life in general, just taking those risks. And it, it's always hard and it's always kind of scary. So <laughs> I was just going to say the harder they are, the more worthwhile they are. That's right. Very true. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I would say that that mentality and that philosophy of just, you know, it's scary, but I'm going to do it and, and just get out there. And especially something like hiking the Pacific Crest Trail. I don't know what we said about that, but 2,650 mile hike yes. from Mexico to Canada in the mountains, mostly. I mean, it's no small feat, right? Like you really need to be fit enough to do that. And, and, and just aside from having the time and the money to, to just be able to take off and do that. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a physically demanding exercise to do all at once. And, but the ability to do that, to make that decision, to, to even make the decision to say, I'm going to go to the Peace Corps and, and, you know, you, you see other classmates going off and, and starting different things, maybe going to grad school, doing whatever they're going to do. And you're like, I'm going to go to the Peace Corps. You almost said you almost said that like it sounded like you were like you took a pause to do that. And then other people had already, you know, your friends had already like, quote, started their careers and stuff. But I don't know. I see it. I see doing something like that, doing something like the PCT afterwards as like technical life skills, like a field school. You know what I mean? Like you're you're becoming more of a. I don't know, more of a, a better, well-educated and educated from a life standpoint person. And that's why, like, I didn't go to college until I was, what, I got out of the Navy. And I think I was like 26 before I went to school for commercial aviation. And then I didn't even go to get my, my undergrad until much later. And I think I graduated when I was like 31 or something like that, <laughs> my, mm-hmm. my undergrad. So I don't even know how I could have gone through an anthropology degree, to be honest, with the understanding that I did as an 18 year old. And I know a lot of people yeah. do it, but I, I think for me, having those experiences helped and it sounded like they were uh, really beneficial for you too. So that's, that's really cool. Um, I'll ask you the same question about the PCT as I did about the Peace Corps. What did you... I guess, refine or learn or improve about yourself doing this? Because you did it by yourself, right? I did. Well, it's actually, (laughs) so I had been home for maybe about two months and I had already visited my brother in Northern California, talked to his partner. She kind of said I could borrow her gear because I was asking more questions and I was living with my parents and I knew I had to kind of drop this bomb that I was going to be leaving again or try and <laughs> trying this ridiculous thing. And, and, and also, I guess a little bit more background. I had never really been an avid hiker. I don't, I think I probably went on a, a camping trip, not a backpacking trip before. <laughs> so this yeah. uh, was definitely something that I was not quite prepared for maybe like physically just from 
being a division one athlete and having that experience of kind of mentally mm-hmm. tough. And it, it was definitely a risk and a chance. And I knew I had to drop the, the bomb to my parents because I had just gotten back from this, you know, kind of crazy adventure where I was in the Peace Corps. I was gone for two years. I didn't come home. And then I was also gone for another couple months to do that traveling trip with one of my friends. And so my mom and I were just hanging out. We were watching a movie. We had a little bit of wine and I was like, okay, now's the time. And so I was like, mom, like there's this really long (laughs) hike. I want to do it. And I was kind of explaining to her and we'd have a couple glasses of wine and she's like, I could do that. Like, I, I want to go with you. And my mom was at a very long <laughs> time too. Yeah. This woman, I love this woman. She's like, never had ramen before. Like never owned a backpack before. Like just not campy at all. Like she, she used to live in like New York city, be kind of glamorous and stuff. And I was like, mom, it's like 2000 like miles, like plus. <laughs> and she's like, well, maybe not all of it, but like, maybe I could come and do the first little bit with you because you do start at the border and we live fairly close. So there was mm. that notion of safety, at least that we we're close enough. Mm-hmm, and yeah. We, we had this illusion, like, all right, if anything gets bad, like, we could always call an Uber or something, which is, like, <laughs> no, you, like, you don't have any service. And, but we didn't know this at the time, so it's fine. <laughs> so we, we went to REI. We got her her stuff. I borrowed a bunch of my camping gear from my brother and his partner, and we started together, and we did the first 40 miles from the border to Mount Laguna, and we went together and I can't even tell you how many miles we did because I, I think it was very low. Like <laughs> I think it was probably like maybe five miles a day. It was very slow. Our packs were ridiculously heavy, but she, she went with me. So she did the first 40 miles with me. And then my dad picked us up. We went to in and out and <laughs> we like showered and then they dropped me back off at the trail and I continued on there uh, by myself. But you know, I think that's the thing about long distance hiking. You're never really alone. There's so many people who are out there, especially now. I think it's definitely becoming more of a cultural thing with Wild by Sheld Strayed or even Bill Bryson with A Walk in the Woods and a variety of different people doing it and their shorter trails. So I ended up meeting a handful of people and I think maybe at mile like 200, I met these two Texas guys and we ended up hiking the rest of the trail together. So I was by myself, but at the same time, you meet people and you hike along the way. So a little of both, I guess. Your, your parents sound wonderful. <laughs> they, they really do. I mean, parents, no, no parents are perfect. I'm a parent. I've got two kids. But I think that you, you were talking about being privileged and, and everything. I think mm-hmm. having parents that are supportive like that or having anyone in life, you know, I've, I've said yeah. a lot that I think you just need one person, one person to believe in you, one person to show you that way one person to show you there is that possibility and to give you that confidence, but to have two people and, and your brother and her partner, his partner. And mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, they're, they're very definitely you're privileged in that way. Privilege. That's wonderful. I'm, I'm really impressed. Yeah. It, and it's hard as a parent to do that sometimes to let them, let your kids, you know, make their way. But um, obviously, you know, it sounds like it's definitely uh, paid off in the long run. And like Chris said, just developed your, you as a person, you know, having these, obviously we we talk a lot about on this, on this um, podcast about having a broad skill set, but that also includes having a broad emotional skill set. And yeah, definitely these kinds of experiences, nothing is lost. So in the last couple of minutes of this segment, before we go to segment three, I don't want to gloss over the stuff you did after this because you just kept doing, you know, crazy, amazing things, went to Spain. I mean, did a bunch of stuff, but we need to get to the CRM part of this podcast three quarters of the way in. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. you, you mentioned you mentioned you landed your first opportunity with the Forest Service after doing, again, some more things. How did that happen? And at what point did you even learn about CRM archaeology and the whole business of archaeology in, in, in a minute and a half, by the way. Okay. Definitely. <laughs> so I think this all kind of, like you were saying a little earlier, Chris, that these experiences were kind of setting me up for what was coming in right. the future. But I, I mean, I had no idea at the time. It was kind of just following those breadcrumbs of what's interesting. And for me, I was doing these things. I had these opportunities. I had time by myself. I only had to worry about myself. I didn't have many other restrictions. And after the PCT specifically, I knew that I wanted to do something outside. 
and I was trying to find jobs. I, I didn't really know mm-hmm. how to get into it. And this is kind of where things change is just online finding a conservation corps. And through this conservation corps, I was able to apply to technically be a contractor under the federal government. So I didn't have to go through the process of USA jobs, which if anybody else has done that, it's very <laughs> uh, arduous. It's uh, you know the pain. difficult. Yeah, it's, it, <laughs> it's, it's really quite gatekeeping still. If you don't yeah. know it, it yes. you have a it's lot a to term. learn. That's a good and, term. Yeah. And this way I was able to just send in my resume. I actually was abroad and I had to do, I think, a Zoom call. And I interviewed (laughs) for the position and they pretty much like back and forth. I didn't end up getting that original job, but another job in the same forest came up and it was working at a ranger station, pretty much giving information. And I was sold. Definitely. They said I could live in the barracks, pretty much in the forest and I would be making money, which I was like, oh, my God, I mean, not a lot of money, but more money than I had. So I was like, yes, absolutely. Like, I'd love to do this. It was in Northern California. It was in El Dorado National Forest, which also has Desolation Wilderness, is in between Tahoe and pretty much Sacramento. Yeah. And I had family in that area. So I was sold. And it just made the process getting into CRM a little bit easier because from there I was able to not only work as a person in the ranger station, but I was able to work in different departments. And I went out with our botany team. I went out with our wilderness team. I went out with our rec team and I ended up doing volunteering with our archaeology team. And that's where I got my experience or my start pretty much. All right. Well, on that note, I think we're going to end this segment and then we'll start segment three with some other questions and just see where you're at now. Back in a minute. You may have heard my pitch for membership. It's a great idea and really helps out. However, you can also support us by picking up a fun t-shirt, sticker, or something from a large selection of items from our T Public store. Head over to arcpodnet.com slash shop for a link. That's arcpodnet.com slash shop to pick up some fun swag and support the show. Welcome back to the Sierra Archaeology Podcast, episode 222, and we are talking to Maggie Berry. And... I mean, right at the end of the last segment, we're, we're almost getting to CRM. You, you went to work for the Forest Service, and then I'm just going to skip a little bit here because I want to leave some time for some other questions. But you, first off, I got to say, you said your first CRM position was in New Hampshire digging shovel tests, and you're, you chose to stay in CRM after digging shovel tests on the East Coast. That is something right there that, <laughs> I don't know, I feel like that's a good gatekeeper as well. <laughs> Oh my gosh. I can't even tell you how excited I was for that job. I was like, I don't know anything. <laughs> just, just try and like make it that they were helping me do like the shovel test in the beginning and my arms yeah. look great. So I was in good shape. So I was great. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Nice. Yeah. I worked in, uh, I worked in Vermont. I didn't work in New Hampshire, but Vermont's the only place I've worked up in New England and that clay up there was just something else. And oh it was raining gosh. most of the time too. It was late, mm-hmm. late summer, early fall. So it was beautiful, but man, was it tough. So after that, you got back to the Forest Service and you wrote up to us that this is your second season as a crew chief on the Rio Grande National Forest in South Central Colorado, where you mentioned at the very beginning of the show that you are now. So you're doing a full season. You're a CRM archaeologist now. That's that's like you're fully into it, it sounds like. I made it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that experience in the Conservation Corps really gave me more direction and yeah. It's very roundabout. After that, I ended up attending a field school in South Central Colorado as well. And then from there, I moved to New Hampshire with a partner and got my first job in CRM. And I was just delighted to have any job uh, doing it because I I wanted the experience. But at that time, I think you guys talk about it all the time, too. It's it's really rough on your body. And I knew I couldn't stay there for the long haul. I Mm -hmm. definitely could have done a couple of seasons, but I already knew I wanted to get back with the Forest Service. I knew that was the path I kind of wanted to be on and I would started applying. And like we were saying earlier, the application process for applying for federal jobs can be quite confusing if you've never had any experience and mm-hmm. you need a completely different resume, your, your federal resume with all of your experience. It's not just a one page, two page. It's everything you've ever done. And it's including a ton of listings. And I think I applied in October And I didn't get my position until about probably March. And that was March 2020. So everything was a bit up in the air because of COVID, of course. So long story short, we ended up moving 
from New Hampshire to Colorado. And I started working at the Forest Service from there. And it was a big learning curve just because I was a crew chief in this position. I was a GS7, if that means anything. There's Mm -hmm. a a grade level for when you work within the federal government. And I was just learning not only how to kind of step into that role as a crew chief, but also how to handle all of the bureaucracy within the federal government. It was a great learning curve. And I was really happy to come back for the second season because I just feel like I'm learning on top of those skills and just how exactly things are, are coming to together. And this season has been really great with just the field work we've done. We actually just finished probably our last timber project of the season. For those who mm-hmm. don't know, within the federal government, there's permanent positions and then there's also part-time or seasonal positions. And right now I'm a seasonal position. I have a 1039, which means that you only have those amount of hours to work. So it's about four months to six months, depending on the amount of money. And when you do get a seasonal position, you also have higher back rights. And higher back rights are essentially if you've done that job within a season. And as long as you don't mess up, if you have a good uh, leaving interview, you've accomplished mm-hmm. whatever you needed to do and your supervisor is happy with you, you're able to just sign a piece of paper and come back for that following year. So you nice. already know that you have a job. And that gave me a huge amount of time to relax during the winter time when I was not working. <laughs> And then also go and do another long distance hike. I did the Arizona trail this last spring and just came back for the season. And a lot of what we do here, which is great, is pedestrian surveying. So uh, (laughs) I did enjoy the the shovel pit digging. And we're actually going to do some excavations later on in October, which will be really exciting. But uh, a lot of bread and butter, what we do is pedestrian surveying. So I get to go out. I get to hike in the forest, pretty much bushwhacking. But we go Mm -hmm. out and find stuff. So that was going to be one of my questions. As a CRM archaeologist, there's a lot of us that work in areas that are seasonal by nature, not mm-hmm. just not just because you have a seasonal job, but just because you can't work out there in the winter. And if you mm-hmm. don't have like an office or lab job or something like that, then you just can't work. So unless you go somewhere else. So my question to you looking forward, well, I guess it depends on your, you know, depends on your, your living situation. I heard a we in there sometimes. And mm-hmm. it it would be really nice, trust me, if you could just do this and then chill out and do whatever you want during that time off. That would be fantastic. And if you can continue to do that, I would highly suggest that you continue to do that because that's amazing time in your life when you can do those kinds of things. Yes. But also, <laughs> yeah, but also, do you have any plans to, I don't know, travel, do other kinds of archaeology in places that aren't seasonal during your off forest time? Or is there some other job or business or thing that you want to do during that off time? And, and before you start, Maggie, I'm curious, can you give us, just because you, you did such a good job kind of giving everybody just a little bit of um, tutorial on, on that process, but what are what is the exact season that you're working from month to month? Definitely. So normally, like they were saying before, with most CRM jobs, it's during the summertime, maybe early spring. So my job, I think this year I started late May. So I think the last week of May... And then I'm going to be working until the first week of November. So I think that comes out, shakes out to about five months, give or take. And that can depend on which forest you're in. And I'm sure too, just in CRM in general, that can depend on which project you're working on. So you kind of always do have that feeling of what's next? What am I going to focus on next? Or where are we going to go? And Actually, we have exciting plans because, (laughs) I don't know, I guess in tradition with a lot of my other adventures, um, my partner and I, we have decided to take the next summer off and hike the Appalachian Trail. (laughs) So another long distance hike. I was just going to say, my sister just did it. Oh, just, really? Just did it. So I was, I was wondering, I wonder if she's going to try the Appalachian Trail. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I mean, I've been thinking about it since the PCT and there's so much culture there and I would just love to do it. And we were really hoping to do some international travel afterwards, but we're going to, you know, we're going to see how COVID shakes out for the most part. Um, Who knows? But I I think too, I remarked on this a little bit in that email I sent Chris originally that I'm in my early thirties. So I'm a bit older than a lot of people starting out their CRM career or just out of university. So we're getting to the point of where are we going to live? How are we going to create this lifestyle? How are we going to make money? And right now it's great to be seasonal. I like working half the year. I like taking time off. 
I obviously like to do long distance hikes. I like to travel. I have a YouTube channel that kind of showcases some of the traveling that I have done or my through hikes. And it's a creative project for me that I, I like to focus on. And I enjoy that, but we are getting to the point of, okay, this is going to be maybe our last adventure. And then we're going to, you know, become more adulty adults, I guess. And <laughs> it's a different I, adventure. I guess, yeah. It's just a different adventure. But, but yeah, I guess don't for you guys. Don't, you, don't, you don't want to become an adulty adult. <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> uh, but, but I mean, it's, it's so true. You, you want the benefits. And I'm lucky enough that I can get healthcare and I can get dental through working seasonally. But then when I'm off, I have to pay COBRA. So it's way more. Mm, And you don't get to attribute to your traditional Roth IRA, I guess I have a, or no, no, I guess I have a Roth IRA. It's not, I don't get to contribute to my 401. Yeah. My 401k. Correct. And I, I think that's a really important attribute to working this job is figuring out your finances. And I've had a a lot of great opportunities. And to be honest, I've never really made a ton of money. But I also think that living in Botswana and hiking the PCT and doing these travel exercises that I've never really lived in a big city since the time I was with my parents, at least. Hmm. And I don't spend that much money on like rent or very extravagant things. So it it allows me to live a different lifestyle. And right now I'm not willing to take on more responsibility, even if I had the opportunity to be in the management position, because I don't want to have that trade off of taking on all that responsibility. And I guess a question for you guys is when did you make that transition from the seasonal to kind of the more management permanent? Was it a choice? Was it a desire? Like how did that transition kind of happen for you guys? Yeah. I mean, I, my answer is pretty clear cut for me. I I was working when I first started, I was in the Southeastern United States, uh, digging shovel tests and uh, Mm. working along the East coast there. And I experienced, I, well, first off, go back to the Navy, right? I, my division chief in the Navy always had and preached kind of like an upper out attitude, right? It was, it was a really, it was, and it was something that really stuck with me. It was like, you know, you're, you're going to move up where you're at, or you may as well just step, step aside and let people do that, that want to do that. <laughs> and I've always kind of had that attitude in any place that I've gone and, and worked in. And when I went into CRM, it seemed like the only way to really do that was to go to grad school. Uh, Mm. That was my impression when I first got in. And again, I went in similar age as you, I was in my early thirties when I was doing my, my first real CRM work. And I I worked for a number of people that went high school, bachelor's degree, master's degree, my boss. And I was like, I, this, I don't, I don't like that. (laughs) And I want to be, I want to be more in control of, of what I'm doing. So that's when I made the choice to, to go to grad school. So, and then quickly within a few years of that, again, I think following the upper out attitude, I ended up starting my own company and just kind of doing my own things. And that's, that was pretty much my path, but that's why that I, why I think that way. So I, I'm interested in, in, Bill's telling his story to you too on this podcast because I don't know how much you've heard of that because he had fewer kids and fewer degrees when we started this show. So yeah, Yeah, I'm I'm building a whole collection here, man. (laughs) Yeah, like uh, you know, it's kind of complicated for me too because the decision to even go back for my master's was uh, not easy because I already had a job where I was getting paid a livable wage that. I was working at, you know, I don't know if we can say the store or not, but anyway, I was working at the store and it had, it's known for having pretty decent wages. But the other thing about it is at the same amount of interval where you're about to quit the job, you get another raise in promotion. Mm. So it's designed for every 400 or 700 hours. I can't even remember how many it was. You'll get a promotion right when you're ready to throw in the towel. And then, you know, when you get to a certain point, there was like stock sharing and other things. So you kind of like, that's how they keep you in for 20 to 30 years. And so, you know, I I got to this point where it was like hard to make the decision. Do I want to stop doing this job where I can actually pretty much build an equation and calculate how much money I'm going to make over the next amount of years and figure out like, you know, what's the end point where I'll be making enough to buy a house? Like what's the end point where I can do this? I think the killer thing was, I applied for a cashier position and I got turned down by someone because I had like two too many 
tardies in a year. And that's like what they were. I mean, I, I wrote a resume and everything. I had a college degree and they opened up the folder. There was people there that had like written that they were interested in the job on a napkin. And those were my, that, that was my competition. <laughs> and so I think at that point I kind of realized, wow. you know, if I'm going to do something here, it's like now, because if I stay another couple of years, I'll be making more money than I can make anywhere else. And my expenses will expand and all that other stuff. So uh, it was it was all or nothing for me. I mean, I gave up a pathway towards adulting to go into archaeology. I got my <laughs> master's degree and then followed through. Like at the same time that I was getting my master's, I was working for. Uh, I went to the University of Idaho, and so I had a a thing through the Anthro Lab to work for the Idaho Department of Transportation. And then after I finished, I had to find a um, job to get me through the time when I was applying to other jobs. But then I got a job in Seattle doing CRM and I kind of never really looked back. And so, you know, I, I was like, you know, I, I spent a short amount of time being a tech, you know, a year or two before I switched over because I had a graduate degree that, you know, I started off with the goal of trying to get a livable wage in a permanent position. And so that's just, I, I guess I kind of started at that point. Oh man. I feel so much of that right now too. Just, <laughs> especially with the, you know, if you really want to get a permanent position, if you really want to move up, you're kind of at the limit right now. You got to get that master's degree. But then That's if I get the master's degree, then I have to keep working in order to pay for it. And it's just that like snowball effect of trying to trying to keep up, but also move up. So, it's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I don't know anything about the forest service, but I would say um, I'll challenge you and encourage you at the same time. You know, I have a, a colleague uh, on my team that has a BA and she has an incredible skill set, both emotionally and in archaeology. And I think she could continue. I mean, she has a terrific position. She is a lead, leads an office and she's terrific. I mean, I put her up against many, if not most of those with MAs and RPAs in the business. So I don't think it's an absolute necessity. I think it's a necessity if you don't have a skill set or you're in a real big hurry to get there. Mm. But if you have a skill set on, on many different levels, like it sounds like you do for sure, and my colleague does, it, you know, there is a pathway to, to go, you know, without that master's degree. It's, it's helpful. I mean, we're working, I'm working with her to, to get that master's degree because she needs, so it would be nice to have those letters behind her name, but that's at this point, all it's going to be there's, she's going to go to an MA program. Nobody's going to teach her what she doesn't already know, to be honest with you. So, you know, it's, but it is having that MA behind her name that will be helpful, but I, don't ever let that stop you if that's not really what you want to do, at least at this moment, because it isn't a gate that you must pass yeah. in order to get there. Because if you have those other skills that a lot of people in this business do not have, <laughs> you still will do well. Just just building on that, Heather, I think that... Um... I think that a lot of people see the different degrees and positions within CRM as a gate. It's like, okay, so I did this. Now I got to make this next goal. Now I got to make this next goal. But the goal really should be, what do you want to do? What are you interested in? Do you want to be a PI? Do you want to write papers? Do you want to write books? Do you want right. to teach? Do you want to be a podcaster? If you want to make lots of money, you'll be a podcaster. So, you know, <laughs> um, but, uh, <laughs> but no, I mean, that's, to me, that's what you because another I learned a lot from that division chief I had in the Navy. Another thing that he told me was wherever you're at, look at the people that have that are at the end of their careers and see if that's who and where you want to be. Yeah, and I also lived my life by that. Right. Like yes. if I and I and sitting at a sitting at a CRM company, even, you know, sitting at the sitting in whatever job you're at and you're looking at another job going, oh, man, I wish I was in that job. I wish I was in that job. The grass is always greener on the other side. But then you look at the people at the top and in some cases, yeah, they're living a great life. They're retiring. They're loving what they're doing. And in other cases, maybe not so much. So you always have to consider maybe the people at the top where you're at right now are not the same people that are at the top laterally somewhere else within this field. Right. So yes. it's always just look at the people that are, I don't know happy with where they're at in their lives and say, is that going to be me? You're a different person. Yes. So yep. you'll, you'll treat that experience differently, but I don't know that that's my advice. If I were to give any bill, you know, the, the final advice that I tell folks is that there is no such thing as like a forever career. You know, we all sure. change. If you look at your own parents' lives, you know, they've changed jobs several different times. So just do this until it's not 
meeting the needs that you need in your life and then find a new job. I mean, you're going to, you're going to outlive almost every career that you'll ever have. This is the United States in Mm -hmm. 2021. You're not (laughs) going to get these long, you know, 50, 60 year trajectories. Even professors don't get to stick around for, you know, 50 years. So just know you're going to live a long time. You're going to need a job throughout most of your life. And so just do the kind of stuff that you want to. And when it's not working out or you've made a mistake, just go somewhere else. You know, there's no harm or shame and just switching, switching directions. Yep. And and then I would say just along that line, just both Chris and, and Bill were saying is that you have to really assess what it is that you want to do and then find a company that fits that. I yeah. mean, you're not going to necessarily stay there, but you might as well do your research and find a company that fits well with your goals. And, yeah. you know, our, the company I work for, we're making a, a major concerted effort to have not only a management desk type career path, but also to have a field career path. So those that really want to make a career, you don't have to, in order to move up in the company or to move in management and money and benefits and everything, that the only way to do that is through management of projects on a, you know, grander scale that you should, you know, be able to have that field career path that you can do and it be just as rewarding. And that is missing a lot in this business. So if you find a company that is like that, if that's what you want to do and you want to have something that's just as rewarding in the field, you know, just really assess, figure out what it is that you want and and find a company that's going to fit that. Yeah. All right. Well, we are just about out of time and I'm out of power. My laptop sitting at this river pier. So, you know, those are two things that say we're done with this show. But I, Maggie, thanks for coming on. Thanks for telling yes. us your story. And uh, and I hope other people hear that and are inspired to just, you know, keep going because they might think they're on some aimless path or something like that. But it's just their path and it, it can lead to wherever they want it to lead. So, again, thanks for coming on the show. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. It was great meeting y'all. That's it for another episode of the CRM Archaeology Podcast. Links to some of the items mentioned on the show are in the show notes for this podcast, which can be found at www.archpodnet.com slash podcast. Please comment and share anywhere you see the show. If you'd like us to answer a question on a future episode, email us. Use the contact form on the website or just email chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Support the show and the network at archpodnet.com slash members. Get some swag and extra content while you're there. Send us show suggestions and interview suggestions. We want this to be a resource for field technicians everywhere, and we want to know what you want to know about. Thanks to everyone for joining me this week. Thanks also to the listeners for tuning in, and we'll see you in the field. Goodbye. 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 Bye. This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV Traveling America, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Chris Webster. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Thanks again for listening to this episode and for supporting the Archaeology Podcast Network. If you want these shows to keep going, consider becoming a member for just $7.99 US dollars a month. That's cheaper than a venti quad eggnog latte. Go to archpodnet.com slash members for more info.